So, welcome. Good afternoon. So Harvard Divinity School welcomes you to our annual Be uh, Billings preaching competition. Um, on June 27, 1904, a check for $2,500 was sent to the President and Fellows of Harvard College for the purposes of the Divinity School to establish a permanent fund with prizes to be called the Billings Prizes. This annual competition began and the prizes were to be, quote, awarded by vote of the Faculty of Divinity to students of the Divinity School for improvement in pulpit delivery. <laughs> Deliver they did. Originally, all the preaching candidates came almost exclusively from a Christian perspective, but in the past several years, our student preachers have been Buddhist, humanist, Muslim, Jewish, Unitarian Universalist, and those affiliated with multiple Christian denominations. Today, we have students, faculty, staff, field education supervisors, and visitors in attendance. We're grateful to everyone who is here, particularly those who are serving as judges. A difficult task. From our original field of 16 preachers during the marathon, four were chosen as finalists. Um, we congratulate our finalists um, and look forward to um, sitting at their feet. Um, Metaphorically, of course. You know, nothing wrong with your feet. But, um, um, anyway, welcome. Uh, we look forward to um, the service and the preaching. Uh, so let the service and the preaching begin. Thank you so much. And not, not quite. I'm not going to preach. <laughs> But I get, uh, as the Associate Dean for Ministry Studies, I get uh, a chance to say a few words. And uh, I wanted to just uh, reflect for a minute with you about the idea of a preaching competition, which seems um, an irregular way to think of preaching, right? Uh, although I've spoken with many colleagues who believe that's exactly what we experience each week. <laughs> with our neighbor down the street and across town. Um, but I like to think of this time that uh, we spend bringing many of uh, the students together, 16 I think this year, um, to preach and then to select a few to come and speak to us. Uh, not only because of the excellence, so the excellence is really incredible, but because preaching is an art that is still at the heart of many traditions, right? The teaching and preaching role that uh, we have and to take the texts of your tradition, if you have texts specific to the tradition or other texts and reflect on them and turn them like a multifaceted jewel to, to find something new to say to a broken world is one of the greatest privileges that uh, any of us have. And so I'm so glad to sit back and listen as you take that jewel and turn it today. And so are your friends and peers, teachers, supervisors, all of us who are gathered. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, are you unaware that we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were indeed buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live in newness of life. For if we have grown into union with him through a death like his, we shall also be united with him in the resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that our sinful body may be done away with, that we might no longer be in slavery to sin. For a dead person has been absolved from sin. If then we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has power over him. As to his death, 
he died to sin once and for all. As to his life, he lives for God. Consequently, you too must think of yourselves as being dead to sin and living for God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. As the cloud withdrew from the tent, there was Miriam, stricken with snow-white scales. When Aaron turned to Miriam, he saw that she was stricken with scales, and Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, account not to us for the sin which we committed in our folly. Let her not be as one dead who emerges from his mother's womb with half his flesh eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, O oh God, pray, heal her. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father spat in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp for seven days, and then let her be readmitted. So Miriam was shut out of camp for seven days, and the people did not march on until Miriam was readmitted. On Yom Kippur, we read that there are three things we can do to atone and change the fate that God has granted us for the year. Tefillah, prayer, tzedakah, charity, and tshuva, repentance. And whether or not Yom Kippur is a holiday that we personally observe, we have all become very good at repentance. We write lists of our offenses or name them in litanies that circle through our heads. We make resolutions, we set goals, we repent, we pray, we do our best to be kind. Atonement, however, looks very different in the Torah. Beginning in Exodus, when the Israelites build a tabernacle for God to dwell in, life circled physically around God. With God's presence among the people at stake, mediating purity was of utmost importance. In the Torah, purity, or rather impurity, falls into two categories, moral impurity and ritual impurity. Moral impurity is the result of defiling acts, abominations such as adultery, incest, or idol worship. Defiling acts disturb the natural order and tear the fabric of relationship, and their effects are permanent, seeping into the land itself. Purity can only be restored through punishment and atonement. All who do any of those abhorrent things, such person shall be cut off from their people, says Leviticus 18.29. Ritual impurities, however, are natural, unavoidable life processes. Menstruation, childbirth, seminal emissions, or, as in the story of Miriam, leprosy. This category of impurities, often relating to sex or death, are not sinful, but they are contagious. A menstruating woman who steps inside the sacred tabernacle would render it impure, and thus, she must follow a prescribed process of temporary separation, followed by cleansing and reentry. So Miriam, covered with the white scales of leprosy, flaking and oozing, is marched through the camp for all to see, impurity exposed and written on her body. Her access to power and to God has been disrupted, snatched away, and she is silent, with shame, with pain, perhaps even with anger. For seven days, she sleeps outside the camp in the desert. The sun burns relentless during the day, and the temperature plummets at night. Snakes and scorpions scuttle across the sand. There is nothing to do, no distractions. Does she walk? Does she sit? Is she lonely? The scales flake and ooze and sting and throb. For seven days, she sits outside the camp and bears her shame. 
and when the seventh day ends, she returns. Translating literally, she is gathered back into the community. Without a tabernacle, without a temple, Jews and Christians have mostly forgotten the ways of ritual purity. But the instinct to seek purity and avoid impurity persists. When I was younger, this meant getting straight A's. Now it means trying never to say the wrong thing. Always, it has meant wanting everyone to like me, to be good. Lately, I have been thinking about moral purity in the context of racism. Racism and the slavery it was designed to enforce is, was, and always will be an abomination, a moral outrage. Torture, rape, murder, and exploitation on the basis of color have shattered the natural order and rent the fabric of relationship. Blood has soaked and defiled the land, and the poison that has seeped into all of our veins will never go away. Punishment and atonement, the only way to restore moral purity. I would argue that on a collective level, yes, this is what must be done. America, the government, perhaps even white people as a whole must be punished and atone, must offer, as the dictionary defines atonement, reparation for the offense or injury of racism. But on an individual level, punishment and atonement have failed. For me and other white people, this has meant guilt and shame and endless I'm sorry's. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I am wrong, I am bad. I fall silent and replay my words in my head a thousand times, I. Because when it comes down to it, as we atone, as we punish ourselves, we are often just seeking purity, reassurance that we are good. What if, instead, white people treated our own offenses not as moral impurity, but according to the process prescribed for ritual impurity? Tragically, unavoidable and impossible to escape. Contagious, harmful to others. What if, when we saw our snow-white scales bloom across our faces, we took it as a sign to step temporarily into the desert and, like Miriam, to bear our shame, to look into the eyes of the person we have hurt and listen as they say, you hurt me, to stand exposed on the spot of our own racism with no distraction from the pain that we have caused. In the past, I have punished myself without truly bearing the shame of racism. And without stepping temporarily into the desert, my desperation to fix an error, to be reassured of my purity, has driven me to explain without taking responsibility, to turn pity towards myself with tears, to suppress and avoid. Elna Refanala, O oh God, Please hear her, Moses prays, and God commutes Miriam's sentence. But still, she must spend seven days in the desert, covered in white scales that look like death. Elna Rifana Lanu. Oh God, please heal us. But unlike Miriam, our reincorporation into the community is always temporary. We must bear our racism and our sexism and our homophobia again and again and again. Prayer and charity and even repentance are not enough. If we want to heal, we must face ourselves in the desert. Our reading today is a poem entitled Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. 
You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over again, announcing your place in the family of things. Here ends our reading. While some of the significant milestones in my life have had the courtesy of announcing their arrival in advance, many more have occurred in quiet, unexpected moments. One such seemingly ordinary moment occurred when I was 12 years old, having a movie night with my mom. We were watching some B-grade Mel Gibson movie called What Women Want, and after it ended, we sat on the couch to talk about the film. And then, all of a sudden, in the middle of my critique of Mel Gibson's fairly mediocre acting, my mom interrupted me. Natalie, she said, I have something to tell you. I stopped breathing. Natalie, I have something to tell you. This was the moment when my mom came out to me as gay. While I was somewhat surprised by this revelation, I was mostly deeply relieved. I remember wrapping my arms around her and saying, Mom, I love you so much. I love you just the way you are. There were tears and caresses and deep breaths. I love you just the way you are. In the wake of learning that my mom was gay, I had several conversations with her about her newly claimed identity, but they were relatively few and far between. For the most part, I didn't really think about my mom's sexuality. I distinctly remember saying to her one afternoon, it's just not something I think about all that much. You're just my normal mom. I really thought that I was comfortable with her sexuality, and I do think that as a 12-year-old who knew relatively little about what it meant to be gay, I did the best I could to be supportive at the time. But all these years later, I realized that in my attempt to be a supportive daughter, I might have rushed to normalize my mom. I've realized looking back, and I can't help be haunted by this idea that Perhaps in the shadows of my support for her lurked a latent homophobia, a desire to make my mom just like everyone else, just like the straight-identified people I had spent most of my life with. But my mom has never been just like everyone else. My mom is a brilliant mathematician, an avid hiker, a passionate educator, an amateur botanist, a graceful ballerina, and the giver of the best hugs in the whole world. My mom is and always has been her own radically unique and beautiful self. Why was I collapsing her uniqueness into something I could better understand? Why was I afraid of her difference? About 10 years after that movie night, when my mom came out to me, marriage equality finally came to our home state of Oregon. Two of the lead plaintiffs on the case were members of our church, and that Sunday, my mom and her partner Becky and my dad and grandma and all of our dear friends gathered to celebrate the historic landmark 
in one of the most moving Sunday services I have ever attended. After years of rallies and ballot initiatives and prayers and sweat and tears, marriage equality for all Oregonians was finally a lived reality. It was hard to believe that it was real. And yet, in the wake of all the joyous celebrating, I was left with this nagging feeling that wouldn't go away. It was clear to me that the movement for marriage equality was essential in extending equal rights to all people, creating a more loving and just community. And yet, I was beginning to feel also that for many people in our society, marriage equality was a way to point to LGBTQ folks and say, see, now that Bob and George are married, they're just like us. Us being, of course, the heterosexual normative majority. This seemed especially clear to me in the language of the court decisions surrounding marriage equality. For example, in the decision of Goodrich versus the Department of Public Health, the case that brought marriage equality to Massachusetts in 2004, the Chief Justice on the case describes the same-sex couples who were plaintiffs, writing, the plaintiffs include business executives, lawyers, an investment banker, educators, therapists, and a computer engineer. Many are active in church, community, and school groups. While I appreciate that the justice is attempting to humanize the plaintiffs here, this statement has profound social implications. Do these particular gay people matter more because they are apparently all middle-class professionals who volunteer at church and thus fulfill an American civil and religious ideal? Do they matter more than the lesbian 30-something artist who works in a coffee shop to make ends meet and isn't looking to join a committee at church? I want to be clear that to the extent that marriage is a civil right, I believe firmly that it is one that should be extended to all people. And marriage equality in this country is a momentous and amazing accomplishment, one that has been, as it absolutely should be, celebrated by many with great joy. But I'm also suggesting that it might be good for us as a country to start thinking beyond marriage equality as well. We need to work to envision a future where all people are celebrated for who they are, regardless of whether or not they identify with or subscribe to culturally imposed standards of what is normal. Yes, as human beings, we all have many things in common, but we also have many wonderful differences, differences which allow for incredible beauty in the world. It is not an accident that the symbol of the LGBTQ community has been, for years, a rainbow flag, the ultimate natural embodiment of the colorful beauty of diversity. The Pulitzer Prize-winning poet Mary Oliver illustrates the beauty of diversity in her now beloved poem, Wild Geese. As her poem comes to a close, she leaves us with this final thought. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese over and over again, announcing your place in the family of things. In these brief yet eloquent, elegant lines, Oliver reminds us that all people have inherent worth and dignity, that no one needs to try to earn that worthiness by being anyone other than who they already are. The spirit of life, the mystery of the universe, has created a space for all of us, even and perhaps especially when we are made to feel as though that is not the case. In reflecting on these issues of identity and difference now, I can't help but think about my childhood self and my own subconscious struggle to understand my mom's sexuality. You're just my normal mom, I told her all those years ago. In my rush to accept my mom's newly claimed identity, I failed to celebrate or appreciate her difference. I denied the full beauty of who she was, of who she still is. 
As I wrote this sermon, I realized that I had never really apologized to her for this. And so I took a moment to stop typing and pick up the phone. I'll share with you now a brief excerpt of what I said to her. Mom, I am sorry if I ever failed to embrace you for all that you are. I am sorry if I erased part of your identity to make myself more comfortable. I'm sorry if my subconscious homophobia shaped the way I treated you when you first came out to me as gay. You are one of the strongest, fiercest, most intelligent, most beautiful people I know, and I would never want you to be anything less than your own wonderfully unique and singular self. Thank you for your courage, your resilience, and your radiance. I promise to strive to be less afraid of things that are unfamiliar. I promise to strive to love you better. I promise to strive to love the world better. May it be so. Amen. Let the assembly say amen. amen. Let the assembly say amen one more time. Amen. A reading from the gospel as recorded by Mark, beginning at the ninth chapter, verses 33 through 37. And they came to Capernaum, and when Jesus was in the house, he asked the disciples, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. And Jesus sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And then Jesus took a child and he put the child in the midst of them. And, he, and taking him into his arms, Jesus said to the twelve, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me Receive not me, but him who sent me. For the next few moments, I would like to speak from this sermonic topic, Do You Want to Be Great? Recently, I watched a TED Talk on tribal leadership by Professor Dave Logan from the University of Southern California. Dr. Logan suggests that we are all members of tribes, which are typically made up of 20 to 150 people. And when tribes come together, societies are formed. The truth is, before we entered into this sacred space, we were most likely interacting with members of our tribe. This may have been via conversation with a coworker or via text with a friend. And not all tribes are the same. What makes one tribe different from another tribe is its culture. In his talk, Dr. Logan describes five stages of tribal culture. The first stage suggests that life sucks. And as people see the world, so they behave. People operating at the first stage view life as not worth living for themselves and for the people around them. We find gang members, prisons, and mass murderers operating at the lowest stage of tribal culture where life completely sucks. The second stage of tribal culture says, my life sucks. Most of America operates at this second stage. <laughs> and the truth is many of us can identify with or know of people who aren't quite where they like to be socially or even financially. They, they may have emotional struggles and fight to stay happy from day to day. And this culture exists in some of the world's greatest companies where people feel that their life sucks. It feels as though you are just surviving but not really living or thriving. The third tribal stage produces a culture that says, I am great 
but you are not. Many of my colleagues here at Harvard Divinity School, and myself included, operate at this third tribal stage. <laughs> life becomes a competition between you and others. No longer does your life suck, but rather your success depends on another person's failure. It's difficult to rise above this third tribal stage because our society is designed for us to feel comfortable right here. Within capitalism, somebody has to lose. There are always winners and losers, which means I must be greater than you. It's fascinating that the church also operates at this stage at times. Preachers, ushers, choir members, committee members can lose sight of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, it is here at the third stage of tribal culture that we find the disciples of Jesus having a conversation in Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 33. They are arguing with one another about who is the greatest among them. They are having a conversation about how one is great and the other is not. We notice that the disciples seem to be completely unaware of and disconnected from the ministry of Jesus. Now it's easy to get caught up over the disciples' arrogance. You see, for I ask myself, do they not know who they're following? Do these men not realize that the one they call teacher is the greatest revolutionary in human history? They have seen Jesus preach to thousands. He's healed the boy possessed by an unclean spirit, and he's healed the blind man by this point in his ministry. Yet the disciples wonder who is the greatest among them. And so Jesus asked the disciples what they had been talking about on the way over to Capernaum. But no one responds because they realize that their conversation was antithetical to the very mission of Jesus' ministry. Jesus, like any good leader, he understands the social dynamics of the group. And so he says, if anyone wants to be first, he or she must be the very last and the servant of all. In this very moment, Jesus reverses the cultural and societal norms that have shaped the disciples' ideas of greatness. He teaches his followers to move beyond the petty competition because they got bigger fish to fry. And literally in a few chapters, we're about to have the biggest fish fry in human history. If the disciples were unable to comprehend what Jesus meant uh, when he said the last will be first, he offers a second example. In Mark chapter 9, verse 36 to 37, Jesus places a small child in the midst of the group, and he says, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Friends, in our postmodern worldview, it's difficult to understand the social location of children in antiquity. In today's world, we adore our children. We, we see them as our future and we put them first. So they become strong and smart and self-sustaining. However, in antiquity, when Jesus is preaching throughout the Middle East, children were marginalized and viewed as second-class citizens, especially in comparison to men. They were essentially invisible. And, and so Jesus tells the disciples, instead of debating who is the greatest among you, bring those who have been pushed to the edge of society, those who are in the shadows, those who have been overlooked, and bring them into the circle. By inviting the child, the marginalized one, the unseen into the conversation, Jesus suggests that you can't be great if you haven't sacrificed and served for this child in that which the child represents. My brothers, my sisters, friends, 
in this very moment, Jesus moves the disciples from the third tribal stage that says, I am great and you are not, to the fourth stage where there was a culture of communal uplift that says, we are great. However, Jesus does not leave the disciples at this fourth stage, but he moves them to the summit of Dr. Logan's tribal pyramid. In the last and final stage, Jesus pushes the disciples from saying that we are great as a collective to saying that life is great for all. In the fifth stage, we should be able to move from one tribe to another tribe and see that everybody is doing just fine. I believe that Jesus allows us to understand what this means when he demonstrated and provided an example on a Friday because he died at the hands of a Roman Empire for the atonement of the sins of the world. And on that Friday, he showed that sacrifice, service, and love are what make you great. These things, they win in the end. And since he loved and sacrificed for the world, he was able to shift a culture of followers from saying that we are great and created a space where life could be great for all. Friends, today, God is trying to take us to another level. And one of these days, we're going to have to face that same empire just as Jesus did. Ironically, that empire will validate our Harvard degrees, and we will have to make a decision whether to debate who is the greatest among us, set uh, with standards set by the empire, or we're going to make the decision to serve, sacrifice, and love for the invisible in our society. And so I leave you with this question. Do you want to be great? Our gospel reading comes from the second chapter of Luke's gospel, 41 through 46. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find the boy Jesus, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. May God bless the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the living of these God's holy words. By the second chapter of Luke's gospel, we fast forward from the infant Jesus to the adolescent Jesus, to the typical, unruly, probably awkward-bodied, defiant, too wise for his own good, and sometimes feisty, I am sure, Jesus of preteen years. What's more is if you're a parent or an aunt or an uncle, or if there are any special children in your lives, then this text will be even more poignant for you. You see, if we read this text through the lens of experience, then you might know then just how panicked you might be if the child that you love, perhaps a child of your own flesh and bone, is lost, is not with you. Imagine traveling for an entire day and then discovering that you were without your 12-year-old and then not even finding them for three days. In fact, some of you may not need to imagine. You probably know. You know that feeling that you had when you turned around in the grocery store and your child was not there. You know that feeling of not being able to reach your child, wondering if they made it home safely on the icy New England roads. You have been there at some point, I am sure. We've got a text here that could take place in ancient Jerusalem or in Davis Square. 
in the ancient synagogue or at downtown crossing, we have a text that we all in some way or another can deeply feel. We know what it feels like to lose something because we're all losers in one way or another. We're losing stuff all the time, and on some days it's usually something trivial like your car keys or your cell phone, but on other days it's something like your mother or your best friend or your marriage, your job, your health, your children, your personal relationships, or perhaps long-held dreams and ambitions have just evaporated into mere illusions. But the good news is that we know that the holiest family of all were some pretty major losers also. Mary and Joseph lost Jesus, and Jesus, perhaps the greatest loser of them all, would several years later ride into that same city towards his death on a pretty sorry-looking, smelly, laughable donkey while the world's most powerful army marched into the other side of town. The Romans thought they could keep peace with weaponry, and Jesus knew that peace would only come with mercy. The Romans would come into Jerusalem with shields, riding on war stallions, and Jesus would come with love. Sounds kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? And then Jesus poured himself out and lost it all for our salvation. You see, I think this text is one that we really need. We needed to hear this text, even if we didn't think we needed to hear it. Our world needs to hear this text. We are living in a world and in a country that is deeply afraid of losing. So afraid of losing are we that we have become more Roman than we have become like Jesus. We live in a time where riding into town on a donkey armed with nothing but love is so terrifying that we'll do just about everything we can to do the exact opposite. We live in a country so focused on the cold calculus of dollars and cents and spreadsheets and winning and being great that we actually focus more on that than on our calling to be merciful. It's easier to win when you build walls, both literal and metaphorical, to keep people out. It's easier to turn away those seeking refuge when you are so afraid that the possibility of welcoming to our shores more broken people sounds terrifying. How scary is it to welcome into our country people who are at their wit's end when on some days we feel that we are too? We live in a country and in a time where national figures can get away with denigrating entire religious groups. We live in a country and in a time that is obsessed with the right that each individual has to possess weaponry that can end dozens of lives in just seconds. We live in a country that is so afraid of losing, losing status, losing wealth, losing strength, so afraid of being weak, so afraid of riding on donkeys and not on war horses, so afraid of arming ourselves with love and not with guns. We're so afraid of vulnerability, fearful of what we might see of ourselves if we sit beside a refugee or someone different from us. We hold ourselves to an impossible standard and forget that the holiest family of all were some of the greatest losers of all. Mary and Joseph lost the Lord himself, a Lord who ultimately lost his own life for us. Mary Ludy is a minister in the Boston area, former minister at First Church in Cambridge, and an acquaintance of mine who once told a story about a woman that she knew who went to the grocery store one night after work. And as she was walking in, the sign that greeted her was big and it was bright and it was accusatory. Did you remember your reusable grocery bags? And Mary writes that that was, that was the last straw for her. It, it broke her. She had had a lot on her plate at work. She wasn't sleeping. The commute that she had was killing her. She had been stopping at drive-thrus every night after 
work shoving the wrappers under her driver's seat so it could still seem true to her that she never ate junk food. Her exercise routine consisted of eating candy bars at her desk. Double booked appointments had kept her apologizing for her own existence. Kind co-workers picked up her slack, it deepened her guilt, every thank you was a self-flagellation, and now this, no, damn it, she hadn't remembered her reusable grocery bags because she could barely remember her own name. And right there, where they stacked the carts, she wept. Have you been there? Are you there now? Out of energy, out of time, out of resources, out of motivation, out of sorts, out of everything, no bags, no breath, feeling like a big loser. Jesus has been there. Mary has been there. Joseph has been there. We worship the biggest loser of them all, the one who lost his life for us. But here's the deal. It's okay to weep. It's okay to do that here. It's okay to do that where they stack the carts at Market Basket. We need to weep, and so does our country. Because when we do, we might just have more compassion for the Mary who lost Jesus, for the Jesus who rode a donkey in the face of the world's biggest army, for the Jesus who was betrayed. And in so doing, we might just have more compassion for ourselves. So why not risk losing it all, being wildly compassionate, for after all, Jesus looks a lot like us. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Let us now step outside the tent in which we shape a tribal identity based in being great while others aren't. Let us go out into the desert, bearing our shame, for we're all losers. We can begin to hear the call of the colorful wild geese, bearing witness to the beauty of everyone just as they are, weeping with compassion and embracing our call to be merciful. Amen. <laughs> 